if you just do it, okay, okay. And we're doing it after 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 brain the former brain guides computer crash. Yeah. <laughs> My computer crashed Wednesday. I uh so I am ill prepared, I suppose I should say, uh to uh uh, uh, or is it ill compared to how I ill prepared compared to how I would have been had I had my computer for the last few days because I had stuff all saved up. We uh, I I did not find the slides, but uh, Lamont uh, provided the slides and I had uh, organized them and put them into a nice orderly fashion, at least for the pollinator section, and lost all of that. So I am so sorry about that tonight. But we have Nestling here, so uh, I mean. I'm going to pass the, the, the torch on over to Nestle because they're going to teach us all about, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> about angiosperms and then we're going to talk about pollination. Yes. Uh, I, like if you remember me from last time, I last time I talked about uh, the marsupials, but this time uh, we're talking about uh, flowering plants. Yeah, we're going to the other side of our family tree. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and plants is actually closer to what I study in, for uh like my professional education, I study plant biology. So this will be a lot more closer to my uh, my my uh, field of study, so to, so to speak. But uh, in any case, I will start the presentation. Let me see here. Um, Do you want us to ask questions see. while you're going through, or at the end of each slide, or you want us to say everything till the end? Well, I, I, I you, you go, of course you can ask questions, but I will try to uh, go through this as quick as possible mm -hmm. uh, because I, I tend to overdo my slides uh, often with my yeah. presentation. So yeah, sorry. Right. So yeah, but still you can you can ask questions if you want. I, I I hope I can do this as quickly as possible. So you you also have the time to say what you want to say about yeah. pollinate. And we gotta get the, the, his st stuff done first too because it's. It's like what 11 p.m. where he is right now. It's almost his bedtime. Uh, at the 10. It's not now 10 p.m. Uh, yeah. So yeah. All right. Uh, but also, sometimes when uh, so I I may go silent sometimes because somebody goes comes into my room occasionally. Mm -hmm. So uh, apologies before uh, before that happens. All right. All right. So let's the begin. Flamboyant flora. The flamboyant flora. Yes. So I will. I will be uh, speed running the early plant evolution to get some context of what plant, plants are before we go to flowering plants. Then I will also uh, cover some botanical terms and then some evo devo of plants instead of animals because we often learn evo devo from animals, but now we will be learning some from plants also. And then I will uh, quickly go over the phylogeny of plants and also a bit of the origins. Right, of, so of I guess starting. I guess starting out, we we separated from plants at the basis of the eukaryote tree, correct? Uh, yes. And here, here we go. The first, like this, is the a more. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite trees of life. You have uh, the uh, basically the uh, the simple uh, life, the bacteria and the archaea. The, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes are the, com the complex, quote unquote, uh, organisms, where the nucleus and organelles. And they originated about uh, uh, 2000 to 1500 million years ago. And uh, they, it's almost quite like, uh, it's it's still, of course, a, uh, a topic of debate, but uh, it's pretty certain that they are uh, that the eukaryotes originated by endosymbiosis between bacteria and archaea to form this complex cell. But of course, the, the details are still being discussed. But it's a topic from uh, a different topic than uh, we uh, we talk about. Of, of course, also later eukaryotes. Uh, some of the later eukaryotes ga gained another organelle called the chloroplast or the plastids, and th and that and that gave them the ability to perform photosynthesis. And then oh, yeah, some of them actually can, yeah. Hmm, sorry. Yeah, yeah I made a joke one time. It's like, but like, uh, I'm tired of eating my own food. I know. Here, I'll kidnap this this uh, cyanobacteria and, and have them make food for me. Ha 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 ha. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's of... really uh, yeah, close to what happened, right? <laughs> right. And and so and actually uh, the the, uh, the the acquisition of the chloroplast happened uh, multiple times actually, but uh, in still 
uh, try to move on a bit. Uh, this is a, a, a more a recent uh, uh, tree of eukaryotes. Also here, so there are some, some controversies with uh, the, the interrelationships. Like there, there's still a discussion about whether excavates are a, re a real group or not. This is based on uh, morphologies or on uh, phylogenetics. Most mostly the genetics at, at this point. Uh, of course, there are still there are some characteristics that we can rely on. But with, mm -hmm. regarding these groups, most reliable data is on genetics. But the the, the, the group you want to focus on is the Archaea plastida. This this group was the first group to gain the chloroplast by endosymbiosis. Let's see here. Oh, uh, where's my cursor? Oh, that's my cursor. Uh, this is another uh, a pretty phylogenetic group. You can see some of the examples given here. Although again, some of the some of these relationships are uh, in uh, a matter of controversy. All right. And here you see the uh, the acquisition of. Uh, uh, of the chloroplasts from cyanobacteria in the archaeoplastids, but also some of these other groups of eukaryotes, they gained the plastids independently, like uh, this, this one here, Polynella, they gained it from another cyanobacteria, but also some other eukaryotes, they gained the plastids by engulfing some of the archaeoplastids, like for example, the, the rhodophytes, they they were engulfed by these other groups to, uh, to and they, that gave them the ability to photosynthesize also. But also there are some controversies, controversies about uh, how these plastids were passed around between certain groups. But again, it's a topic for a different uh, 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 talk maybe. Different line. Right. Different, uh, maybe we'll move on to uh, a subgroup of the archaea plastids, uh, which is the uh, Viviridae plantae, also called the, the Chloroplastida, and they originated about one, roughly one thousand uh, million years ago. They are they are all the, the common name for this group is is the green algae, but it, it is a uh, this is a group that also includes the land plants. So green algae is a bit of a paraphyletic term. Technically speaking, land plants are also uh, green algae. But yeah, and as you can see here, many groups invaded the uh, terrestrial habitats independently. Uh, also, and one subset is called the streptophytes. They invaded fresh water very early on in their history. And then the subset of the streptophytes is the land plants, the embryophytes. And they originated about, uh, give or take, uh, 500 million years ago. Although, the, although they, they, became, they became noticeable only in the fossil record by 475 million years ago. Because of the rainforest collapse? Oh no, that's that's that, that occurred later. Like they, uh, like we first no, we first oh, noticed their, uh, we first noticed we first noticed the land plants about uh, in the in the Orovician by their uh, I think spores in the fossil record, mm -hmm. and that's when they became very noticeable. And they are the land plants are characterized by a terrestrial, of course they are terrestrial, but they're also characterized by a diploid embryo. This is where we see a, a very a significant shift in their life cycle. Uh, originally, the diploid, in the, the, the diploid stage was single cellular, as you can see here in the, uh, the green so algae like, lineage. Like asexual almost? Uh, no, no, no. They, they, did, uh, they did do sex, but uh, when they formed the zygote by sex, the zygote undergoes uh, meiosis immediately. So it's, 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 the, the diploid stage is only a single cell at this point. But then in the land plants, the, the diploid became multicellular, the, called the sporophyte. And the fertil fertilization happened inside in uh, uh, an archegonium is called, and uh, that's, uh, that's how it happened in land plants. However, later in uh, in non-vascular plants, the, the diploid sporophyte, this structure here, uh, remains uh, dependent on the, uh, uh, the haploid uh, structure called the uh, gametophyte. But then in vascular plants, the sporophyte became uh, free living and, and the dominant phase of their life cycle. And in, and in, the, in modern, uh, modern living vascular plants, the, the, the haploid, uh, phase became very uh, very small like you, you almost never see them basically they became 
uh, only a few cells at, at this point in the life cycle. So if, if we, we, we basically went the other way. First, the uh, the, the haploid phase is uh, is the, the dominant, and the diaper phase is very small. But now it switched around in the in the vascular plants. So the vascular plants, also called the uh, the tracheophytes, originated in the Silurian, and they are characterized by uh, vascular tissue, roots, and true leaves, which enable them to grow very tall. Uh, most non-vascular plants uh, are just a few centimeters tall. But I think the tallest is about 60 centimeters or just two feet, uh, because they like because they don't have any vascular tissue, they cannot transport uh, water uh, very high up above the ground. Oh, yeah. And that's the reason why vascular plants are basically the only plants you will see at uh, uh, at, uh, at your eye height or higher than you yeah. are. Yeah. So yeah. So they probably needed that to, to, to take over the land. Yes, yes. At, at, at that point, uh, from the Silurian on to the uh, Devonian, especially the, the, the Devonian, they uh, basically the, the, the whole uh, uh, land masses became green with uh, very tall uh, plants. Yes. And then and in a subgroup, uh, a subset of the uh, the vascular plants are these spermatophytes, also called the seed plants. And in them, the embryo is enveloped into a, in a seed, uh, which, may, which makes them resistant to uh, uh, desiccation and also allows for dormancy. Basically, now the, uh, the offspring can basically lay dormant for a long time and wait until favorable conditions arrive before they will grow. So yeah. It's, it's basically the, the equivalent of the uh, the, uh, the the hard, the hard shell egg of uh, land uh, vertebrates, basically. Like in in, amphib in amphibians, the, the the egg is uh, very soft and wet, and they they need to keep uh, moist. But in 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 things like reptiles and uh, birds, they the hard shell egg allows them to basically uh, uh, survive very dry conditions. And this is also true for the seed plants as well. Uh, in, in here, the, haplo the haploid uh, phase is further reduced and no longer free living. Like, and if you go back a bit, bit like in the inference, for example, the uh, vascular plants, the, this gametophyte is still free, free living, although very small, but still free living. But in seed plants, the, uh, that, that phase is no longer free living. It's, it stays inside the... Uh, the ovule, basically, the ovule is the female gametophyte, and the pollen are basically the male gametophyte, and they are not, they, they don't fr uh, live freely all around. Although, of course, pollen float in the wind, but apart from that, they don't uh, live on their own independently anymore. But yeah, also this is of course, as I said before, this is where we see wind pollination in the seed plants. And uh, and and uh, one of the very interesting fossil uh, species is uh, is called the Rancaria uh, in the, from the Devonian, and it's a transitional seed plant, uh, which which is almost a, a complete seed, but it lacks a solid seed coat and a pollen guide system. So it has some characteristics of seed plants, but not all of them. A transitional fossil. So yeah. Okay. And further down, uh, the, the seed the seed plants uh, the, or the early seed plants were also called seed ferns because they they retain some typical traits of the ferns, but they also uh, had seeds, so they also a bit of a transition. But and these 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 seed ferns flourished during the carbon, carboniferous and also oh, so during the period. So this is the time here. of lots of plants. Yeah, lots lots of plants. Yes, they flourished during the carboniferous and Permian. And after the Permian extinction, the, the, the modern gymnosperms, basically the, the conifers and cycads and... Oh, hold on. I, I need to switch my uh, ear, earbuds. Hold on. All right. Oh, my, my, my earbuds, uh, they were low on battery, but okay, uh, it, it's, it's fine now. Uh, the gymnosperms uh, displaced the, the seed ferns uh, throughout the uh, Mesozoic, the, the time of the dinosaurs, until angiosperms came around during the Cretaceous. 
and now we have now we are going now we have arrived at the uh, the topic of interest the angiosperms also called the flowering plants and the, the uh, angiosperms is is a greek name for contained or uh, vessel seed which which refers to a trait that they have which i'll explain later uh, also uh, to uh, to explain gymnosperms means naked seeds because in gymnosperms like uh, conifers the seed is basically naked to the environment but in, in angiosperms the, the seed is, is inside a structure which like i'll explain like, later like like a, like a fruit or something yeah yes exactly but i'll i'll explain that in more detail later yes uh, angiosperms today they are uh, uh, they include like uh, between 300,000 to 400,000 species over 90% of all plants are basically angiosperms flower plants so yeah so i will talk about this later but how, so how did the angiosperms become the dominant life force in the plant world uh, i will explain it in a, in a later slide uh, if you want to uh, uh, to be patient about it uh, i will i, I will go on about it. Yeah. So. yes yes yeah uh, but uh, of course and uh, in angiosperms the uh, the plants are uh, pollinated either by via animal or wind but of course uh, brainback will uh, explain it later on uh, and uh, they also develop fruit which promotes their dispersal of seed which is a, a different thing from gymnosperms like in gymnosperms they tend to not be dispersed by uh, by animals and in the and they are also uh, flowering plants are immensely significant to our uh, uh, to uh, to us our uh, our modern ecosystem and even our, our as humans our civilization culture history and probably existence without angiosperms we probably wouldn't uh, exist. and of course for Valentine's Day of course yeah yes exactly <laughs> all right so uh, to go over some botanical terms to really understand what a angiosperm is. Uh, and what, what typifies the angiosperm is, of course, the uh, the organ they are named after, the flower. And the flower is basically consists of a uh, a base called a receptacle, and then followed by the organ, the the, the elements or organs which is organized in worlds. And the first world, the the, the non-reproductive world, is called a perianth, which is in uh, if it if it's undifferentiated, it's called a paragon which consists of uh, tepals. But in most angiosperms, they are differentiated into a calyx, which consists of sepals, the, 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 the green bits right here, these are sepals. Or, uh, and also followed by a, a, a corolla, which consists of uh, petals, the colorful uh, uh, leaves of the flower. So, and, and then, then within these worlds is a uh, Androesium, the, the, the male part of the flower, uh, which consists of stamens, the filament, and anther, which, which house the, uh, the pollen. And then in the middle, we have the uh, uh, Gynoesium, which consists of uh, carpels, the, uh, uh, the stigma, ovary, and style. And of course, the, the ovules inside them, where, where the, the seeds, uh, when, when they are fertilized, this, this will be the seed. And uh, and then later, of course, we get the fruit. But uh, of, of first of the uh, the elements, the raw elements can be organized in a variety of different ways, like sepals and petals uh, can form uh, can uh, for, uh, form tubes or trumpets, as you can see in some flowers. Or they can also uh, and stamens can also be fused at the top, base, or throughout. You can have a very different varieties of these, uh, how these how these structures are organ organized in different plant species. Of course, and also carpels. Uh, carpels can be uh, a single carpel, or a flower can have a single carpel, or uh, multiple separate carpel, or they can or they can be fused in different uh, ways. So, are carpels like seeds. And the carpels are like, are like the, the the basic structure of the female part. Like this is oh, a carpel. Okay female car part but uh, some flowers can have one carpel some have uh, multiple carpels fused or unfused so it's a, like a, a numbers game basically some have one some have two or more 
so it's, and so it's kind of like the, so that so then it's kind of like the the womb of the flower the with the baby seed yes, grows. Yes. Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, uh, so, something about the reproduction, uh, the, uh, the the haploid gametophyte is in uh, most often just a few cells. Like po pollen, the the male gametophyte consists of just three three cells, and the ovule, the female gametophyte, just seven cells. And one cell has two nuclei, as you can uh, see here in this in this part. Uh, oh no! In, in, sorry, in, in this part of the they have, they have uh, one cell has two nuclei, and in in in, in uh, flowering plants, something very interesting happens. It's a uh, you have uh, something called double fertilization. When a when it's fer when the when a flower is fertilized, you have two cells that are being uh, fertilized. Like one becomes the uh, one the zygote is diploid. This would become the embryo, and another cell the uh, the one with two nuclei becomes the endosperm, which will be, uh, in most species, will be triploid. And the, the endosperm is basically uh, the, the nutrient uh, for the zygote, which contains starch, sometimes oils or proteins, and it, it serves as the nourishment for the embryo. So kind, of like, so kind of like the, the yolk or the placental it, on end mutes. Yeah, actually, but uh, but it's it, it, it's a bit weirder because we have now double fertilization. So basically, every plant, every flowering plant is uh, a, a twin, but one of the twins will be just food for the other for the other twin. <laughs> so because of one is uh, is separate, like the, the the yolk basically is separately fertilized uh, from the other. So yes. So 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 it's then more like it's more like if you had twins and one ate the other twin in the womb. Yes, basically, yeah, and of course, uh, you, 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 like it's uh, almost quite certain that you have uh, uh, eaten the endosperm because when you eat grain or uh, or corn, the starchy substance that 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 that's the endosperm. That's where that that stuff comes from when you eat grain, especially and, and such. Because and, and that's why uh, that, that's that's basically that's basically where most of our calories come from that we eat. You monsters eating, eating <laughs> those things. Yes. All right. And of, uh, also one thing about the uh, uh, flowers, like mo in most plant species or most flowering plant species, the uh, the plant is a hermaphrodite. Basically, each flower has uh, both male and female parts. But sometimes you can have a plant where you have uh, the male flower and, uh, and the female flower separately on the same plant. A good example is corn. Like corn has uh, one flower where the pollen comes from, and the ears of corn is the female uh, flower, basically where it comes from. But, uh, and some and a few plant species are really weird. They have like separate individuals of female and, uh, and male uh, only flowers. Okay, again, I don't know if you're going to do it later on. This reminds me of a question I have later. Um, does it help? I, I mean, since they since they both have so plant has both female and male parts, it could probably self pollinate itself. But is it more helpful yeah. for it to pollinate another flower instead of itself? Um, actually, I didn't include it in my slide, so you, I will answer that now. So uh, yes, as many flowers can self pollinate, although most often they will they have mechanisms to prevent that. For example. Uh, the, like some species, the, uh, the, 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 they will produce pollen before their female parts become fertile. So basically, they will first release pollen, and then after they have to release pollen, the pollen, then the, the female part becomes okay. fertile, receptive. Of, uh, right. So uh, it's also one, one way. But, but, uh, however, in some species, they will actually promote self-fertilization. And, and it's actually something that... Uh, uh, like a, like a, I, I don't remember the, de the details, but in, uh, Charles Darwin noted that some flowering plants uh, promote cell fertilization, and he hypothesized that in these species they they rely on only one, only a few species of pollinators. Uh, which uh, uh, and, and and his hypothesis was basically uh, correct uh, in a recent study. But uh, uh, cause, yeah, because I because I knew with an, with animal sexuality, you know, if you go. Yeah. The more you diverse you are, the more uh, genes and stuff, and 
things you build up against the past zones. I don't know if it's the same with flower with flowers too. Plants, you, you get more yeah. diversity if you go go out go out of your community for sex. Mm -hmm. Right. So the uh, plants have various mechanisms to promote the outcrossing. Yes, but they, they can self pollinate. But uh, most often they will uh, try to to do it the other way. Yeah, but. Uh, Another thing, another thing about flowers is the way they can be organized on the plant itself. It's got uh, the, like a, the, the structure that, that house that uh, grows flowers is called the inflorescence. And in many different species of sometimes sometimes families of, of uh, plant species, they have a specific uh, structure in a particular pattern, basically. Some, uh, and in some uh, pl uh, flowering plants, the flowers can be uh, densely packed into a structure that it's, it's almost it's very often mistaken as a single flower. Uh, one of these is the, uh, the, the family Asteraceae, which uh, has something called a capitulum. And uh, basically you have many, many different uh, flowers densely packed into a, uh, a structure, which basically looks like a flower in, a, in of itself. You, you, you see here these individual flowers, and but together they form a structure that's almost uh, many people will say, "Oh, this 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 one flower." Also, also uh, sunflowers. Sorry, sunflowers are not real. They are just multiple flowers densely packed on a, a single structure. Okay, you have uh, different types in the middle. Uh, disc flowers without uh, petals. But on the outside, you have a ring of uh, flowers with petals, and that's uh, and that's where the illusion comes from. All right. If also the family uh, uh, Aracea, uh, where you can see uh, in, in this this flower, although the flowers are just these uh, these tiny little things uh, packed on a uh, spadix, and the spadix is surrounded by not, not a petal but a bract. And, uh, you can, and this is also another a related species. This species is often mistaken as the single largest flower, but since it's technically not, it's, since it's technically not a single flower because the flowers are just on this structure right here it's a uh, it's not the, the largest flower technically speaking sorry you you cheated you can you, you, you don't get to cheat <laughs> for the for the title uh, another good example is the uh, is uh, uh, figs like a fix the flowers are on the inside surface of a uh, uh, receptacle and and of course, uh, um, Breva can perhaps uh, elaborate further on the uh, how how, uh, how, how this species. Mm -hmm. Yes, fig wasp, exactly. But, but I will I will uh, I will leave the discussion for you. M moving on on to uh, another topic, what exactly is a fruit? <laughs> it's uh, it's a bit of a debate on the internet whether, uh, for example, tomatoes are fruit or vegetable, and you have many different memes. Yeah, that makes fun of this. Uh... From what I've I I heard read. The fruit part of the plant is where the seeds are stored, and that right. everything else is everything else is vegetable. Right, exactly. So, uh, I like uh, as as this says, knowledge is knowing that uh, the tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not is uh, not putting it in a fruit salad, and philosophy is uh, is wondering whether it means uh, ketchup is a smoothie. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in in some, I I don't have a problem that in some context the tomato is considered a vegetable. Like in the like, if you are making a fruit, as if you're making a fruit salad, I don't expect you to put it in uh, to put in a tomato. But in this context on, of this topic, we want to uh, go over what a fruit means in the botanical term. So, what is a fruit, at least botanically speaking? A fruit is a mature ovary that develops often only after fertilization. So that's uh, that's the botanical definition. Which means that the, yes, the tomato is a fruit, and so uh, and fruit is uh, and tomato is also a berry, technically speaking. So are uh, uh, nuts, uh, legumes, uh, and also uh, 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 cereals like uh, rice and uh, grain from wheat, and also uh, corn is also uh, the tiny kernels of corn are also fruit, and sunflower seeds is also a fruit. Not, not every time. This is where the confusion comes in. We often think of fruit as a fleshy, sweet structure, but not every time, like an, an ovary, not in every species, the ovary does not uh, always develop into a fleshy structure. Sometimes it's just a, 
uh, a, a coat, a, a hard coat around the uh, seeds, such as in, in sunflowers. Like if you eat a sunflower seed, uh, the, the, the fruit part is just the outside shell and the inside is the, is the seed, basically. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's the, barely a fruit. The oil. Basically. Like the sunflower yeah. seed, it, yes. Even so, though so, sunflower so, seeds is, oh, sorry, go ahead. I gotta say, so when you eat, so when you're eating sunflower seeds and stuff like that, you're eating, you're eating baby plants. Yeah, basically, yeah. You're getting your fruit yeah. for the day. Your, your, your. Fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, sunflower seeds, yeah. Sunflower seeds are, are barely fruit, but technically they are fruit. But yeah, it's uh, yeah. And you have also different types of fruit. You have uh, a simple fruit where where the fruit develops from a single. A single carpel or, or a few of used carpels, but you have also aggregate fruits where you have uh, oh, hold on, I lost my cursor. Uh, and you have also aggregate fruit where the, the fruit develops from a single flower but separate carpels. So, for example, a raspberry, which is not which is technically not a berry because a berry is a type of simple fruit. So uh, a raspberry is, is then not, not, not technically bad because it's an aggregate, an aggregate fruit where each different fruitlet is called comes from a separate uh, carpel on the flower. Does this mean that raspberries aren't ras aren't berries either? Yes, exactly. But, is like, it, uh, so, but so, I heard an apple is a berry. What about mulberries? Uh, I don't I don't know about mulberries. Sorry. What about apples? apples? I don't know. They have similar uh, structure. Uh, uh, ap apples, are, uh, apples are accessory fruit. And because uh, I, I will first go over the multiple fruits mm -hmm. where, the flower, where the fruit comes from separate flowers, like a pineapple is a good example. A pineapple has uh, as an in, uh, as an inflorescence where uh, the flowers are densely packed on, uh, onto, a star, on, onto the inflorescence. And then the entire fruit will come from separate flowers, which is called a multiple fruit in this case. So yeah, so, it, so when you eat a pineapple, you can see these these uh, separate uh, cells, and each cell is a single flower, or come, came from a single flower. So yeah, but in the case of apples, you have uh, what's called an accessory fruit where the uh, it's a bit weird because the uh, if you define fruit as coming uh, developing from an ovary, the uh, the apple is is only a fruit re regarding the core. Only the core part of the apple comes from the ovary. The, re the rest of the apple comes from... Uh, oh, hold on. We have company. So, 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 so Bree, what's, what's your opinion on all of this so far? Um, yeah, I actually had some some ideas and things to say about uh, about fruit development because uh, the, the coevolution I was talking about before with uh, between between flowering plants and uh, and animals the not just in in the reproduction and pollination but also in in seed dispersal and in, in the way that they uh, that they disperse over the, a geographic area uh, through having these enticing fruits uh for the frugivore uh to, to you know tempt the frugivore animals uh like us because we're frugivores too and uh yes we have transported awesome. so many uh species in our feces around the globe <laughs> all right uh, i'm back so sorry uh, about that okay real fast though look at these things uh, on the left side here you see some the, these seeds can be eaten like the pea seeds and the raspberry seeds and raspberry stuff but on the other side yeah. the the seeds can be e eaten like the apple seeds no matter what a certain uh, d dinosaur quote expert tells you yeah it's uh, as, as, as i saw some pl some flower plants they they have mechanisms to protect uh, their seeds specifically because they, they don't want to uh, to have the seeds destroyed destroyed uh, of course or, or be eaten sometimes like in a uh, in the case of apples, also you can you can swallow you can swallow the apple seeds whole, and they will remain. If you, if you don't chew them, they will remain intact uh, throughout most of, most often. But yeah, uh, and they also con they also contain uh, poison sometimes. Uh, apples, yes, they they have uh, uh, a 
And, and metabolite that will become uh, a cyanide when you met metabolize them. So yeah, you can. <laughs> it's also a, a weird how they will. I will do that. Oh, did you have a question, Brainbach? Oh yeah, I was just gonna. Uh, did you have a slide touching on uh, on the uh, avocado and the dispersal on their on their seeds? Because I think that's a really interesting oh, topic. That you got the uh, acronym or whatever in, in acronym because they don't. Yeah. Have... I, I, I I think I, I think I did not include it, but it's also okay. uh, uh, also a good point. Like, like in in many cases, like uh, of course, fruit sometimes uh, or in many species, fruit are specifically intended for dispersal by animals. And, and avocado mm -hmm. is a good example because they they were in or the plants intended to have them eaten by giant animals like uh, crown sloths or comforters. But mm -hmm. then after they went extinct, now you have a uh, what's called a, a an evolutionary anachronism where uh basically a uh, uh, the the evolutionary ghost of the past where where, where a species is, is dependent on an animal that no longer exists although we came along and uh, we we found uh, the avocado tasty so we kept them for ourselves luckily so yeah <laughs> but i was uh, I, I was talking about, oh sorry go ahead oh no thank you for going over that uh, yeah Thank you. Yes. I, I was Lucky we decided to like, hey, let's make some. This plant makes good, some good guacamole, so let's 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 make it our own. Yes, and of course, I, I would invite you to look up. Uh, uh, I think it's called evolutionary anachronism, uh, mm -hmm. where, uh, and you can see many different examples of like there are, there are many plants that are, that are evolutionary anachronists because the plants tend to survive longer than the animals that they used to rely on <laughs> but yeah right, right. Uh, right. and I will, I will continue with this like i was talking about the apple where the uh, only the the, the the center of the apple comes from the ovary what what surrounds the uh, the apple comes from i will uh, i will continue with this slide here what surrounds the apple comes from a structure called the hypantheum which is basically a fused uh, base between the uh, the 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 uh, the uh, pedal uh, the pedal and the uh, 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 people and also and also part also part of the uh, the stamen basically so you have, a, you have a fused part of the base of these other flower parts and when the when the when the fruit develops this base also develops uh, into a a fruit like structure surrounding the ovary so. You get a weird situation with the, with botany where you can say the tomato is all fruit, an apple is only partially fruit, and the strawberry is mostly non-fruit because the strawberry <coughs> is, is, is uh, basically is only uh, uh, mostly comes from the uh, receptacle, the, the the base of the flower. O only the out like the, the green bits of the strawberry, those are fruit because those are those came from the ovary. And in, in the case of uh, uh, ginkgos, they uh, they grow something like a fruit, although in this case, it's only a fleshy seed coat, not an actual fruit. Because, because ginkgos are uh, gymnosperms, they are naked seeds. So even though the, the seed is surrounded by a fleshy structure, it's still a naked seed. Pretty, pretty weird. Yeah, ginkgos are weird in this case. Uh, also, this is a, a, a good figure I found uh, recently on Twitter. You can uh, look this up yourself uh, to see the free of the room. Yes, and you can see like uh, like uh, many different types of fruit and how they are categorized in uh, at least in the terms of botany. You can see the simple fruits, the aggregate fruits, the multiple fruits, and the accessory fruits. Is it just they... me, or is this stream getting really fruity? <laughs> yes, exactly. But I will, I, I'm the, I'm not the. Oh no! Last slide. Uh, <laughs> corn is actually is actually fruit. The plant is a grass, so corn is grass fruit. Botanist Skeletor will return with more plant facts. <laughs> I love my last slide for fruit <laughs> for this day. Uh, so yeah. Now we come to uh, the Evo Devo part of flower evolution. So, as we have come over previously, flower uh, flower elements. We have uh, the, the tepals, the petals, the, the stamen, and the uh, carpels. Uh, and it has an, an interesting hypothesis by uh, a guy named Goof. Uh, and he, 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 he said that the, uh, basically every part of the flower, even the carpels and the stamen, are modified leaves. 
So they are they they came from these like in in the in the case of uh, tepals and petals, it seems obvious because the petal is basically a colorful leaf. It looks like a colorful leaf, but in the case of the over, of the uh, carpels and the anthers, it's not quite obvious. But uh, it's a, it's a it's a good hypothesis because in the uh, Basically, according to this hypothesis, you have a, a leaf, like a cardinal part, the anther. It comes from a leaf where the pollen was produced on the outside uh, edge of the leaf, which basically became reduced, uh, only, only forming the, uh, the, the anther in this way. And regarding the, uh, the, the female part, you have, uh, you have ovules forming on the, uh, the, on the, the edge of the, uh, of the leaf. Uh, but but these, these became enclosed, protecting the ovules. And over time, you get the, uh, the carpal structure. So basically, the seeds is, in, is surrounded by a, a, a leaf-like structure. And, and that became, and according to this, this hypothesis, it, this became the, uh, the female part. And, so, and that, this is how uh, flowering plants uh, evolve according to this hypothesis. So what is the evidence supporting this hypothesis? Now we have to go over some... Uh, uh, details of how flowers develop, the ABCDEs of flower development, and it's a this is a very uh, complex uh, topic. But I will try to simplify it in quickly. In uh, plants, you have uh, plants also have homeotic genes, which are called Matz box genes. These are analogous to the homeo box genes of animals or, or Hox genes of animals. So animals have Hox genes, but plants mainly have uh, Mats box genes, and the uh, and uh, these are involved in what's called the uh, the ABC model, or the uh, uh, one model of uh, flower development is called the classical ABC model. Each letter is uh, denoting a set or class of genes. When you have uh, basically when you only have the A the A set of genes expressed, that will induce the, the development of the calyx, the sepals, the, the green. The green leaves on the outside of the flower, when you have A and B genes expressed, that will induce the corolla, the, pe the petals, and B plus C is the androecium, the anthers, the male part, and C only is the uh, female part, the carpels. And in other, in, in other models, you have uh, also uh, D and E class genes, although there's a bit of a debate about whether. Uh, Whether D, whether uh, D class genes are a subset of C or E is also a subset of A. But uh, if you want to know more about this topic, you can look at the citations here above. Yep. So yep, we have we have the sources yeah. in our in our video, so go check them out if you want more yeah. stuff. I include, I include my source in the slides. Uh, and you've also here as another source in the slides. So this is a is a more uh, if you uh, this is a more detailed uh, picture of the. Uh, the ABCDE model, where you have also uh, class E and class D included. And what, what's going on is actually these match box genes are transcription factors and they form what's called a complex of four protein, a tetramer. We can see here, oh, you can see here like a, four, a, a complex of four separate proteins and they bind to each other and they also then bind to DNA uh, to control the expression of different genes. And, it, and this is how they work. When you have uh, class A and class E uh, together, they form this uh, four, uh, four, uh, four protein complex and they will induce the, uh, the, the tepals. And when you have uh, A, B, and E, they have this, this uh, quadrat structure and they will induce the petals and these stamen and so on to, uh, to complete the development of the flower. So this, this is how the... the, the, the This is, this is what's going on at the molecular level when these genes are expressed. So uh, also one detail is like the, to clarify, these genes, the A, B, C, D, E genes, they don't make the flower. They only induce uh, certain, certain, certain genes or, uh, or block certain genes. So is that, uh, that, that, so would that be the like, development flower. Yes. so, so is, the, is the, e, the E thing kind of like the hawks The hawk gene of the plant world. And they, they are, they are all, they are all like analogous to hawk genes. Like they are, are the A, B, C, D, E. They are all, they are all mad box genes, and all mad box genes are like analogous to uh, to hawk genes. Yes. So like here, you have mad box genes, 
and they are an analogous to the animal hawk scenes. So yeah, it's a it's just a bit uh, a bit uh, a detail of this. It's like uh, animal in animals they have like uh, I think they have many different hawk scenes, but only a, only a, a handful of mad hawk scenes. But in, in, in plants they, they also have hawk scenes. But in hey, plants, fast, in mass I gotta, I gotta yeah. enter the door real fast. Uh, you two all right. continue talking. I'll be back in like two minutes. Oh, 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 all right. So, so in uh, in in, uh, in 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 plants, there it's uh, exactly reversed. Like in plants, they only have a few hawk genes, but they have like a uh, hundred or multiples of hundreds of mass box genes. Mass box genes are really important in plants. Not o not only for flower development specifically, but also for the entire uh, plant development, basically. So yeah. And here have you have you the how uh, the consequences of uh, when you mutate these uh, matchbox genes. Basically, you know the experiment where you have fruit flies with uh, mu mutant eyes or mutant antennae or uh, uh, like weird phenotypes with uh, uh, hox genes. This is the plant equivalent of that, basically. So you have see, you see here on the left the the, nor the normal pattern of uh, A, uh, B, C, and E genes. Uh, where you have a, a normal flower, but when you mutate the A gene, what happens is like A and C, they uh, inhibit each other. But when you mute it, you, when you, so when you knock out a, the A genes, C will fill up the entire structure. So when you what you, what you get is uh, carpels, uh, stamen, stamen, carpels, o o only only uh, carpels, stamen, stamen, carpels in this pattern right here. And you get it, you get the disappeared uh, flower with with no uh, sepals or petals. And when you will get uh, and when you uh, mutate uh, the B class genes, what you get is this pattern here. Where you only get uh, sepals, sepals, carpels, carpels. So no petals and no uh, stamen or anthers. Yes. So. And now, when you uh, knock out the C class gene, now the A the A class gene will fill up the entire structure, and you will get uh, as uh, also another interesting is the C class gene also has an important function. It terminates plant growth. So without this function, the flower does not know when to stop. So when it so, uh, it basically repeats the same pattern over and over again. You, you get uh, sepals, petal, petals, and then sepals, petal, 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 sepals, petal, petals. So basically, the you have, you have a, what's called a, a double flower. Basically, you have a flower within a flower within a flower without the uh, without this uh, terminating signal. Huh. And this is what happens in this is what happens in uh, many commercial variety of roses. When you see a rose with many different petals, they, that, they that often was, have. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when you were talking about it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. We yeah, they, 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 often, they often have this mutation too, yes. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you knock out uh, uh, the E class genes, the, it, what happens is the plant doesn't know how to make flowers. So it goes into a default state, which is basically leaves. The flower parts become leaves as a default state. And this gives support to uh, the hypothesis that flower parts came from leaves. But you can also do the you can also do the other way other way around. Like now, like here we have turned flower parts into leaves, but we can also turn leaves into flower parts. And then now here they've expressed these uh, uh, these genes, which are the uh, the A B C D E genes that, that, that I uh, that here. These these are, these are like they have specific names, but these are the A B C D E genes for this uh, flower plant development. When they expressed. Uh, uh, or when they overexpress these genes into this plant, the, the wild type here, now you get uh, petals in place of leaves. So basically, you have, you have turned the leaves into petals. And here, and here sometimes you get a, a spontaneous mutation like this, where a, a leaf uh, close to the flower uh, picks up some of the same signals, and that, and that turns the one one part of the leaf into a petal. So yes, you can turn you can turn you can turn a petal into a leaf and a petal and a, and a leaf into a petal. And that is more more support for the hypothesis that, that, that uh, flower parts are modified leaves. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I hope I'm not 
And I hope I'm not uh, taking too much time here. Oh, no, this is fascinating. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'm trying to keep up. So, mm -hmm. Also, some, some uh, things about the uh, inflorescence development. When, like uh, the inflorescence, again, inflorescence is, is the part of the flower that begins to grow uh, uh, the flowers. And what, what basically happens is you have, uh, oh, to, to simplify it, but there's much more going on than I'm showing here. But to simplify it, you have two important genes called SOC1 and FT that induces a phase change from a, from, from a vegetative marrow stem to an inflorescent marrow stem. A, ve a vegetative marrow stem is basically the part of, of the plant that continues to grow from the stem, so basically. And when it, it's a, a vegetative marrow stem, it only grows a green part, like leaves and uh, more stem. But when it, when it transitions into a, an inflorescent marrow stem, it uh, begins to uh, it begins to grow, uh, to uh, grow the, flo the the inflorescence basically. So yeah. Uh, so so quick question: mm -hmm. the, the evil devil a, a, a plant? Um, mm -hmm. Is it is it like with the with animals? The, the more the smaller the zygote, the more it looks like eat the plant looks similar. Mm -hmm. Once it gets more development, it looks differently or something. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I, th I think it's a, something similar. Like uh, when you have uh, a new plant, you of, often see the, the, what's called the baby leaves or the cotyledons, of, or cotyledons, uh, the, the first two leaves that you have, you will see. And it's, it's often the case that uh, in closely related species, they will often look identical. Like the, a baby, a baby uh, uh, the tomato plant will often look identical as a, to a baby uh, potato plant. But even though as they continue to grow, they will then they will grow uh, very di very distinct uh, types of leaves. But yeah, it's, it's something similar going on as well. Yeah. So of course, of course, animals and plants are um, very different in other regards. So you have to look it up yourself if you want to know more about the uh, the, phy the phylotypic stage of uh, plants. But to continue on. Uh, when you have the inflorescent marrow stem, now you, they, they, they can receive the signal to form a fluorescent marrow stem but when they begin to actually produce the flower. It's caused by uh, a feedback loop between uh, two, another two genes, uh, leafy and AP1, induces, which induce the, uh, the inflorescent marrow stem. Uh, as you can see in this figure, leafy and AP1, the inflorescent marrow stem. However, uh, another gene called TFL1, it uh, uh, represses leafy, uh, and the and TFL1 ma maintains inflorescence marrow stem, although uh, the AP1 gene right here it also represses the TFL1. So we have like a, a like a, uh, a crosstalk between these three genes, and the interplay between these genes determines the, the pattern of the inflorescence. Like if you if uh, if you have like uh, these two genes, if, they, if these two genes dominate, then they, it will quickly develop uh, a, a, a one or a few flowers. But if you have uh, if you have uh, a this gene only dominates, then it will then the plant will continue to, to grow and grow and grow without producing any any uh, flowers. But in the well in the well type, you have an interplay between these, where you can see oh it it produces. Uh, the, the flowers in different patterns, but yeah. And to see to see here further on, uh, more, more mutation experiments. When you mutate leafy, uh, one 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 uh, uh, gene important in uh, the inducing flower development, you have only inflorescence, no flowers without this gene. When you mutate TFL1, like uh, uh, this this gene, it uh, without this gene. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't repress. It doesn't repress leafy, so you can you have a, a, a direct flower formation. So basically, you get something like a, a tulip, where, you, where, you, where the, the stem immediately ends in a, in one flower and no no complex inflorescence. I, but there's another. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I'm gonna say I don't talk about this yet, or we're going to talk about. If you talk, say it. I don't know if you talk about it while I was gone, or you can talk about it later, but. Angiosperms are the plants that we, as humans, decided to do a little uh, what's the word? Uh, artificial selection on it, right? That the, the so forming plants, 
those are all Can you repeat it? Correct. Okay, you repeat it. Sorry, I, I, I cut off for, for a moment. Angiosperms are the ones that we as humans decide to go all artificial selection on them. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, I, th I think I think there are some plants that are not angiosperms, but I think for virtually all plants to, that we have domesticated are angiosperms because yeah, I think they, pretty much all of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much all of them. Yeah, yeah. Except for yeah, think, think, yeah. You can, uh, yeah. we have some uh, vast or some uh, gymnosperm like uh, club mosses and stuff that we, that we have cultivated, but most cultivars are, are angiosperms. Uh, yeah. I was thinking of that because you talk about how the development of the leaves and, this, leaves and stuff, like like how we like made the leaves, you know, like we want this plant to be more leafy, so or yeah. we want this plant to be more buddy or, or more flowery or whatever. Oh, you're talking about like, like what is it, brass, brassica? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Funny that you mentioned it because this is here an, uh, a relevant notation note, like I was about to talk about this particular mutant. If you really? muted the AP1, <laughs> if you muted the AP1 gene, then the TFL1, like a TFL, the TFL1, which is the which is the gene that maintains the maintains the efflorescent meristem, without TFL1 being suppressed, um, it causes an accumulation of inflorescent meristem. Basically, what you get is this only inflorescent meristem, which is a which is basically cauliflower, and that's how you get that's how you get cauliflower. Cauliflower is Something that tries to make flowers but doesn't know how to. <laughs> so yeah, and that's that's and, and cauliflowers are part of the uh, the brassica that you mentioned before. Yeah, that's uh, that, and that's so ironic, right? That it that it's it's basically what you were just talking about with with mixing up the genes and things, except for the broccoli mm -hmm. or the broccoli and cauliflower. I think both have that same genetic defect if you will that, yeah that they yeah, try, that, they want, yeah. That, yeah that they want to make that they want to make flowers but don't have the genetic information in their genes to do yeah. it so they keep trying to make flowers out of stem right yeah right exactly so yeah. to, to repeat in the wild type you have this mm -hmm. with without leafy you have only inflorescence but no flowers without uh, tfl1 you you have a, a, a direct flower development with no complex branching and without AP1 uh, you have uh, something called something akin to a cauliflower it is but yeah all right so now now we get to the, the last part of how these genes evolve like you have uh, the, the leafy is it is also a transcription factor and then this evolved originally in uh, in uh, like uh, the the ancestors of uh, flowering of, of all land plants and they they Promoted, they also promoted uh, gene expression, and in the and in bryophytes, they have a role in cell division and uh, also sporophyte development. But they came, but later in flowering plants, they became co-opted to form the uh, the, fl the floral mer meristem in the, in the development of flowers. And regarding the matchbox genes, the uh, the uh, the hawks. Uh, and, and analogous to hox genes in plants, the matchbox genes, they evolved originally from uh, uh, from, gene, from uh, uh, proteins that, that, that only formed a dimer, a complex of two proteins. But when they later when they uh, later evolved further in land in land plants, they gained the ability to form both dimers, like a, two, a complex of two, two proteins, and also tetramers, a complex of four proteins. And with further uh, further duplication and uh, specialization, you have the, you get basically some uh, basically this in flowers. So these this the, these complexes of uh, four proteins evolve from the classic uh, uh, gene duplication and divergence. Uh, for, uh, and it's a common common way how uh, you diversify a genetic toolkit. Uh, to generate an evolutionary novelty, and uh, the, the, and it's also interesting to note that the matchbox gene expansion in seed and flowering plants correspond to whole genome dupli duplication events. Basically, in the ancestor of seed plants, you have a, a, a whole genome duplication, and uh, specifically in the ancestors of flowering plants, another whole genome duplication, and and. The, the pattern of duplicate of whole genome duplication matches the pattern of the duplication regarding the matchbox genes as well. 
so yes it's an interesting story to uh to note uh now a bit of flow uh, a tip uh, I'm, I'm almost done just a few minutes i'm uh, a bit of a uh, angel for a uh, you have uh in, in recent times, the angio, the phylogeny of angiosperms uh, underwent a very uh, major update because uh, how, how they actually relate to each other is uh, based on genetics and has been very different from how we used to think about the interrelation between angiosperms. But now, uh, in nowadays, we have uh, they are uh, related as such. We have basically uh, a, a, a basal lineages called the uh, the ANA grade, which is a parallel grade, and also the core angiosperm. Also called the mesangiosperm, mes mesangiosperms, the core angiosperms. So going over uh, the, uh, the, these lineages, the, the most the most a uh, ancient lineage that, that, that diverged from all other flowering plants is a single sp surviving species called Amborella, and and uh, and uh, cons uh, consistent with the uh, with the uh, uh, like uh, oh sorry. Uh, like a, they have diverged from the from the common ancestor from all other flowering plants. So it's like a just just one 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 species sister to all the other flowering plants. Did this it, is a very hmm? sorry. Did it survive in isolation? It looks like it might be in Oceania. Is that yeah? It? Okay. Yeah. I think I think so. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a very re, uh, very remote part of the world. Yes. Also. So it's like a, a, a last survivor a last survivor of a very ancient lineage of flowering plants, and it's, it's also very. <laughs> Like, like, like yeah, like it's oh maybe like a platypus uh, mm -hmm. equivalent to all other mammals, and it's also it's also very strange characteristics uh, compared to all other flying plants. For example, in these plants, the uh, the, the stamen is basically still a leaf-like or more leaf-like, consistent with the hypothesis that that, uh, that they are they, they come from flowers, and also in them the carpels are separate, and also they are not fully enclosed. It's, it's, they are still like the, the, the structure is still a bit open. But it's only s sealed a sticky secretion in the in these plants. So it's not it's, it's not fully fully enclosed yet. So it's, it's almost like a living transitional uh, species basically in this regard. So in all in all other flowering plants, the uh, the the carpel is fully closed, but in this one species, it's not fully enclosed yet. Or or maybe it will never will but still yeah. All right, moving on. Uh, another uh, uh, basal lineage is the uh, Nymphaeales, which includes uh, about 80 species of water lilies and uh, a family called Hydatelisae, yeah, I think, how you pronounce it. And another uh, basal lineage is the Astrobiales, about 100 species of various woody plants, but also one notable species that you may know, the Staranese, where the Staranese comes from. Mm. Which, which makes you uh, rice uh, or some spicy uh, dishes very, very flavorable. Yes. And in, in, in within core angiosperms, you have the uh, magnolids, about 9,000 species, including the, uh, the, uh, the bay leaf, uh, another, another spice that you often use, and also black pepper. When you use pepper, it's a, it's a magnolid too. And Another uh, basal lineage is the Chlorentales, about 77 species of, of aromatic plants. And Ceratophiales, uh, six, six species of fully, like a, a very weird lineage, six species of fully aquatic angiosperms. Uh, often mistaken I, I, for. for yeah, these, these, from the distance, these almost look almost like the gymnosperms. Oh, I, 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 I was about to say that they, most people mistake them from hornworts, like. Uh, bryophytes and they, they look like uh, uh, like uh, something like a, ho uh, a hornwort, uh, like or, or an algae, but they are not algae, they are uh, very derived uh, angiosperms. They almost oh, don't wow. look like angiosperms at all, but they, they are still angiosperms, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, but for, uh, algae, I was, I, was thinking, I was thinking more of pines and stuff, mm. right? But the, because they, they are because they are fully submerged in water. They don't really need their flowers, and that's why they, that's why you don't see the flowers. But they, they still have flowers, but the, but the flowers are highly reduced. So do these plants uh, go back yeah. to the water like some animals did? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, basically, yes. They are like the uh, the equivalent of a uh, a, a terrestrial tetrapod going back into the water to become 
something like a, 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 an aquatic uh, algae, like a whale algae, yes. or a sea or yeah. a <laughs> dolphin. Oh, also these are fresh water, but still, it's, it's, it's almost uh, it's comparable to that, yes. But moving on, you have uh, the last two remaining lineages, the monocots and eudicots, they are the, the, uh, very important. In uh, or something about the flowers again, in in, in basal or basal lineages, in the, in the basal angiosperms, you have uh, an undifferentiated perianth. You have only uh, tepals, like uh, no, you have no. Uh, if you, you don't have se uh, petals or sepals, you only have one type of uh, uh, colorful leaf surrounding the reproductive part. But in but in eudicots, something happened regarding the uh, the A B C D E mantox genes, where you went from uh, a, a fading border expression pattern between these genes into a strict uh, border pattern, and this and, and this cha change in expression pattern causes the differentiation between uh, sepals and petals in, 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 within eudicots. In, in uh, monocots, they still have an undifferentiated perianth. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, for example, when you see, uh, like, um, uh, what's an example? I, I, oh, maybe I will give you a good example. Like, in, in orchids, orchids don't have differentiated uh, uh, petals and sepals, they only have uh, petal, uh, tepals, but in, uh, in most eudicots, they are differentiated. And, and uh, yeah, but uh, in uh, regarding these two groups, they basically like uh, uh, almost all angiosperms are either monocots or eudicots, like they like have uh, uh, about uh, 23% uh, of all angiosperms are monocots and about 74% are eudicots. A bit in monocots, uh, mo like uh, a good a good portion are orchids, and uh, another good portions are grasses. Like oh. e even though, oh, so so go ahead. I I I like a joke. I I heard orchids are very very naughty bad flowers. Yeah, yeah, they they, they are really specialized in in enticing certain insects. So, sometimes to the degree that they only they are only pollinated by one species. But, uh, of course, brainbuck. I think you have more to say about that. Uh, uh, continuing on with the, the, the grasses, the grasses are like one of the most important groups to, uh, of us. Uh, like um, like our uh, like most of our calories, as I said before, comes from the endosperm of cereals like corn, uh, maize, or uh, uh, corn or maize, barley, and a great grain, barley, yes, and um, and rice. And these these plants may basically um, made our civilization possible because when we when the first civilizations came around, they, they relied on the staple crops for their uh, sustenance. Yep. And, and the eudicots, yeah, but the eudicots they are basically most most plants. They include most trees uh, un unless you see a conifer or something like a palm tree, which is, which is technically not a tree. But it's a basically a giant herb. Because it's it's a uh, it's not that uh, like a, a tree is defined as something that is made of wood and has separate branches and because the palm tree is not that technically uh, uh, a, a tree in that regard it's basically just a giant herb and the same regarding uh, banana trees they all they all bananas are also monocots yeah but uh, uh, but yeah it, it, they they include so so many different species i cannot i cannot go over them all so i will just continue with yeah. the origins of or finish with the origins of angiosperms and this has been famously uh called as an abominable mystery by charles darwin because in his in his day uh flowering plants basically a bit of out of nowhere with no nothing in the fossil record to uh elucidate their origin but, uh, but since his day we have learned a lot more about about their origins, but I will first uh, explain the, what used to be the, pro the problem. According to the fossil record, the first unambiguous appearance of angiosperms occurred in the Cretaceous, some sometime of between uh, or sometime of around 135 million years ago. And uh, uh, right after that, the the biodiversification bio of angiosperms caused an explosion of a. Uh, 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 in quotations, a long explosion yeah. from uh, like about 100 to uh, 50 yeah. million years ago. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I heard that. Well, yeah. like how the these like like how the dinosaur is dying off. Let let the mammals become the dominant diversity. The same thing happened yeah, also, with yeah. the gen and your sperms. Yes, yeah, so like in in this time, like between like from one hundred million, like they, the flower plants first of like they unambiguously appeared in, in the fossil record at, at least. They, are, they they began around uh, one hundred and thirty-five million years ago, but but by one hundred million years ago, they began to out out dominate the gymnosperms, and the, and their diversification caused a major uh, rev a revolution. Uh, like they 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 promoted the diversification of uh, of course insects. And uh, uh, lizards, snakes, and uh, also mammals and such. So they, they they made the modern ecosystem as we know today. So and if you a like reason flowers, you better yeah. you better think yeah. think that asteroid that yeah. hit Earth. Yeah. I did, 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 this this period has often been called the Cretaceous Terrestrial Revolution from sometime between 166 million years ago. But in a late in a late paper. The, the scientists argue to extend this period into uh, uh, from 100 to 250 million years ago and calling it the angiosperm terrestrial revolution because it, it's really the angiosperms that drove this uh, change in the ecosystem. Yeah, and uh, and this made the and this made the world uh, the highly diverse and modern world that we know today. Yeah, and continuing on. Uh, but that, that's, that's the fossil record. But according to the, the genetics, the molecular clock, angiosperms and gymnosperms diverged from each other sometime in the Carboniferous. And the last common ancestor of angiosperms occurred uh, in the Jurassic or even as far back as the Triassic. So there is a, a gap between the time when angiosperms should have uh, appeared uh, according to the genetics and the fossil record when they are put in the Cretaceous. And this is, this is because they call it the angiosperm gap. So now the, the problem was that, that we, we needed to find angiosperms in the Jurassic or maybe in the Triassic, because we only have angiosperm, fossil angiosperms in the Cretaceous. And the, the, we know actually of some candidate stem angiosperms, like angiosperms that are related to, to modern angiosperms, but not uh, but not uh, uh, or more more closely related to angiosperms than to anything else. These are the uh, these are the Glossopteriales, the Pentoxiales, the Benetidales, and the Cationales, and they range from the Permian to the Tria Jurassic, Cretaceous, or Triassic to the Cretaceous. Again, if you want to know more about these guys, you can look up the citations here. And they also show, they also show some similarities to uh, to angiosperms, like they are. Oh, they are, they, they, the structures are like like uh, in between cones and uh, flowering plants. Like they are like a, it's something in between almost. Some of these, like some, like some, some, like in in the case of Glossopteridiales, they so like they are, they are very ambiguous. Like some some think they are more closely related to gymnosperms actually, but uh, and others sometimes they think they are more closely to angiosperms. So there there are some. Uh, debate about uh, these these groups. And you have also uh, potential pre-Cretaceous angiosperms fossils like Ar Archaeofructus is a is from the Cretaceous. It's a, it's almost almost definitely an angiosperm, but it's still Cretaceous. Uh, we have Nanginganthus from the Jurassic uh, candidate. Although there is also a debate about that. Some some scientists do think it's a actually a uh, like a, a, a crushed. Uh, uh, Co or something like a cone that has been crushed by preservation and it, it looks like a flower, uh, a flower, but not actually a flower. Again, there's also so, so some, some debate about that. Oh, so go ahead. About fossils, do it, are any YECers asking for machine linked or transitional fossils of the of the angiosperm plant things? Uh, I, I think I think they do, but I, I don't. I don't see uh, creationists talking about plants very often. Like they mostly focus on animals. But, uh, uh, and to be fair, yeah, yeah. And to be fair, many and to be fair, many many people focus mostly on animals. Like plants get so often ignored. Uh, sadly speaking, yeah. bugs get ignored too. <laughs> yes, exa exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's also also a thing. Yeah. But uh, but to continue on, it's also Sam Sam Miguela. That is for another potential pre-Cretaceous angiosperm from the, the Triassic 
to the Cretaceous. So like it, 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 this one species is very long, apparently. Um, although, however, something changed very recently. Like uh, these papers uh, were like, uh, I think from last year or, or from this year. I don't remember actually. I think, I think last year. Uh, yes, it, in this one from 2021, I think, yes. And they describe uh, almost definitely angiosperms from the Jurassic. So now we have closed, uh, like we have reduced the gap between fossil and molecular dates for angiosperms. So yeah. And well, now we should look at the, at the time. Uh, I'm, I'm done with my uh, part. So thank you for your patience. I hope I'm not, uh, I've not been too, uh, taken up too much time, but yeah. No, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that, for that, mm -hmm. uh, all that information. Um, and it gave me plenty of time to get this stuff set up too, which is not an easy task. These are not, uh, not the most cooperative. Go ahead and put me on the full screen there, Vandalia. Uh, these are not the most cooperative of pollinators. These are painted lady uh, butterflies, and uh, they are mature. They're they're reaching their their final uh, length of, leg of their life. Uh, they're about they've been butterflies for about two weeks now, so they don't have too much time left in them. This one, I was trying to get it to uh, feed on this flower here. It's actually more interested in. Uh, Nibbling on my uh, on my fingertip, then it right, is. You gotta try to pollinate your finger of the flower. Yeah, it, it it likes the the salt and oils in my in my skin. They they like oh, that yeah. stuff too. It's it's something else that attracts them. Butterflies will land on your, your if you if you like mow your yard, yeah. you like go lay down on the. On, you know, I've seen I've seen pictures of like uh, spr sprinters with their uh, where, where they where they see uh, butterflies uh, landing on their socks, uh, sweaty mm -hmm. socks, where they will drink the sweat mm -hmm. from the. Yeah. So, you, so yeah. this is basically almost a, a live viewing of a poll attempt at poll pollination. Yeah, we're attempting pollination pollination right now live on your uh, on your stream. So mm -hmm. that's actually what we're doing. If I can get it to, it it has licked my fingers several times while I've been sitting here trying to get. I could I thought maybe it would land on the flower. But I believe so, you have a female milk butterfly to like innate with. So you, can have, you can have baby caterpillars. Yeah, we got a, we got a whole a whole bunch of them. Um, they they mostly they haven't been eating flowers. They've been eating uh, uh, just sugar water that I mixed up for them and put them in a uh, thing that 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 leaks it out for them and they get, they get a little bit of fruit and everything. But uh, yeah. they generally uh, these are pollinators and you will see them around like butterfly bushes and things like that. Uh, this one is actually missing one of its legs, so it's uh, it's not not exactly uh, in, in the best condition, but you can see it uh, giving us some little flutters there. So it is still uh, still good is to go. It, I think it smells. Uh, is it is it unable to fly or? Uh... Um, it can. Uh, it's not flying well. It's uh, but it can fly. Oh, oh. there it goes. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, go ahead and uh, I'm gonna snag this little guy. I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Be uh, careful. So, yeah. yeah. Where's my mouse at? <laughs> All right. Where'd you go, little fella? Oh. Uh, so. Yeah, the butterfly, butterflies are very neat. They. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Also, also like the, the the entire Lepidopteran uh, class, well, that, that includes moths. It's also an interesting thing to note. Like a moths, like butterflies are actually a subset of moths when you look at the phylogeny. Like uh, it's, it's a paraphyletic group, right? M moths are like a, the, almost the entire uh, oh the entire Lepidopteran group, and then, and it includes a subset called uh, butterflies. Right. Yeah. Butterflies are moths. So <laughs> all butterflies are moths, but not all moths are butterflies. And there are other groups of moths that are that are more different from other moths than they are from butterflies. So it's right. It's uh. Uh, the the term moth is how we use it as paraphyletic or poly polyphyletic. When I say paraphyletic, uh, it's polyphyletic, which is not uh, not not beneficial, not useful. Now, butterflies and insects. Actually, I did have some stuff that I was gonna oh, pull wait. up. If you wanna, oh, hold on. Oops. Um, let me see Oops. here. So, it's not very good at stuff. I just kind of threw together this morning on a, on a slide thing but uh let me share what i got and, uh yours might be better actually but i have kind of talking points on mine okay, here, i gotta get him so, back i actually got him removed them somehow yeah we're gonna share that 
Yeah. Come on, there you go. Get it. He is sticking his proboscis in there, um, but it's whether or not he's successfully oh successfully feeding. I don't know. Uh, they like their sugar water better, I think, than they do the uh, the the natural stuff. Come on. There you go. He's getting it. There you go. Oh, I'm trying to move my hand so you can see it. <laughs> and he falls again. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you're just you're just gonna keep fluttering around, aren't you? He really wants to fly. <laughs> Like, uh, live so animals. What so, so what happened? That was the genetic thing or captivity thing or what? His legs are. Uh, why his leg got damaged? I don't know for sure. Um, they uh, when when they were when they were caterpillars, uh, uh, some of them, a couple of them, fell. They give you like a cloth liner for the lid uh but some of them didn't i don't know if it was a problem with the way that they were connected on there some of them fell and i had to like tape them back up and i don't know if that if the fall affected their development but sorry this is on uh just on my inkscape here but uh okay. the most common insect okay, well, so i guess it reduces, it, it, it reduces real fast so mm -hmm. so brie how did plants go from having sex via the wind to having sex via animals yeah, we're gonna we're gonna find that out right now because the Cretaceous, like, uh, and and I'm not gonna follow up with a lot of technical stuff uh, because uh, yeah, I don't really have the uh, the the credentials to 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 push that. I, I just want to uh, talk about basically pollination um, and dispersal. So uh, pollination is gonna be the first thing that we're talking about, and we're gonna discuss how and why those things evolved in. Uh, different lineages of, uh, of organisms, what we call coevolution. Uh, now coevolution is when two organisms, uh, through the process of evolution and mutualism, or, uh, also a, uh, a sort of evolutionary arms race, uh, as well, which is also something that, that, that comes into play when we talk about, uh, coevolution is called the, uh, escape and radiate coevolution uh process like but, like like lions and, and zebras yeah where dif the different features of an organism are sculpted and uh and uh directed towards success based on their interaction with other organisms in the environment and when we talk about a pollinator we're talking specifically about the relationship between uh organisms that fall into the kingdom of anima animalia and uh organisms that fall into the uh the kingdom of plants. So uh, that is specifically what pollinator, what a pollinator is. Uh, pollination can be uh, achieved through multiple uh, means through, uh, uh, I think uh, Ness covered quite a, a bit of them uh, and covered quite a bit about this as well, but we're just going to kind of go a little bit of a deeper dive into it. But the way that uh, the, in the plants reproduce by carrying the gametes via the pollen from uh one flower to the other and fertilize the uh the the, the female uh parts of the flower and I, he had yes. some good good uh slides about that as well so i'm not gonna dive too much into that but bees in specific are the main things bees and butterflies that i think that most people think about when they think of pollinators and there's a good reason why because in our uh region of the world especially in the in the temperate zones the primary uh, pollinators are butterflies and bees, well, also flies, but uh, the flies that do the pollinating and the wasps that do the pollinating, for that matter, do have a great way of making themselves sure look a lot like bees. So people think of bees even when they see a fly pollinating flowers. Pirates will stay away from them. Yeah. It's, a, it's a type of it's a type of mimicry. I think it's, yeah. a, it's called Malarian mimicry or uh, mm -hmm. something else. Or, like Marian, uh, uh, is that how you say it? Marillion. I think Malarian or Malarian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, I know a lot of uh, fa farmers ha bring in beehives to pollinate their crops. Right, because uh, that's actually because of the uh, what we're experiencing, which is the insect decline, which uh, in some areas. 
are up to 80% of the uh, insect biomass has disappeared. So it's, it's very troubling. Yeah. And these are tropical areas uh, where a lot of our tropical fruits and things come yeah. from. And we're uh, you, you were correct. It's, it's called Batesian. Like Batesian mimicry Batesian. has been, uh, it's been like one dangerous and mm. one harmless share the same signal. Yeah, and Batesian. Molarian is where two harmless share the same signal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, but and uh, also, uh, you talk about that real fast. Uh, also, that that was the major thing lat two years ago when the murder hornets came around. They weren't murdering humans; they were murdering uh, our bees population. Right. Okay, so uh, the and the the reason that we think of is, is think of uh, bees and butterflies is because in the area of the world that that we live in, that's mostly what's doing the pollinating. Them and hummingbirds. But you get into tropical areas, you get into uh, uh, the Congo or the Amazon. Uh, some of the uh, the islands in uh, in Southeast Asia, you'll you'll get a lot of variety of pollinators. Yeah, there's a lot of well, more, more diversity, a lot more diversity down there. Than we're going to talk here. about that a little bit here later on uh, as well. Um, so pollination is is pretty basic. You carry in the pollen, uh, which uh, comes from these. Uh, uh, can you see my mouse? Yeah, uh, which comes from these uh, and. The bees have little uh, little saddles on their hips that, that they stick to. Now, pollen uh, is specialized to uh, to the way that it's dispersed. So if it's dispersed by uh, by bees or animals, generally they have little sticky barbed hooks on them to, to cling to the little saddle bags on the uh, on the, the bees or uh, they stick to the, the little fluff on the butterflies one way or the other that... Uh, that pollen sticks on there and they carry it on over here to the yeah. stigma of this flower. Now the main factor that comes into play and it didn't actually did not come up uh, in uh, in Nestle's uh, slides, which I was a surprise is, is nectar. Nectar is so right. important to animal uh, yeah. Uh, pollination. Yeah. I talk about that. The, the, I, I heard that was true enough. I heard before, before they had nectar, the animals were actually eat, eating the, the pollen, not the, not the nectar from the plant. Yeah. So yeah, the the nectar is to uh, entice the the pollinators. Uh, in all, it, it, they release uh, uh, pheromones into the air to say, "Oh, this is you want to get some of this uh, sweet sweet nectar I have down in my flowers." And the animal climbs into the flower to get it, and it uh, it also collects the pollen and then goes to the next flower and disp distributes the pollen. So. Uh, Nectar uh, nectaries are glands. They're they're plant glands that secrete just the sweet liquid. Uh, it's thought that they evolved initially to, uh, and this is just the the leading theory right now. There are other theories as well that they evolved uh, to distract uh, folivorous uh, ants from uh, from eating the leaves. Yeah. So. Uh, they would have these sweet spots similar to the way that aphids do uh, to distract the ants from eating their, from eating them. They secrete honeydew, which is very similar to nectar, a sweet secretion to uh, appease uh, the potential foliovore. Yeah. So Please it, don't eat me, eat my uh, waste instead. Yeah. <laughs> eat this, food. eat this sweet, sweet sugar. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's how, uh, kind of how these evolved and then when pollination came and we we think that uh that nectar secretion evolved uh before flower flowers by the way and there are uh still plants today that do secrete uh have nectaries on other parts of the plant that aren't on the flowers to different and they do perform different functions because nectaries aren't always necessarily something sweet uh sometimes they can secrete uh uh something that's noxious into the air mm -hmm. uh to control the population of other plants around them, so there, there, there are also, a, a lot of invasive, uh, invasive plants will, will do that as well. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I've actually this is also interesting to see. Like I've, I've seen a paper where they say that the uh, like the pheromones that, that plants use to attract uh, pollinators evolve from uh, obviously modified pheromones that, they, that were used to uh, deter. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. That's what, <laughs> I just, what I was just going over about the ants. Um, so, yeah, was, so is animal, pollen, is animal pollination uh, more, more accurate or, or better for the plants than wind or water pollination? 
uh, better. Uh, it's I'll say, I'll say better, but you know what I mean. It's so some of the crops that some of the the best grain crops that we have, or the most abundant grain crops we have, are not uh, pollinated yeah. by uh, by insects. They're actually like like corn is not, does not need us to pollinate it. Uh, I think okay. most wheat. Most most of the wheat yeah. family and oat family don't need, but a lot. And they, they are they are all like grain is a subset of, of grass, and all mm -hmm. grasses are basically wind pollinated. Right. So yeah. and grass is the success of grass, and people don't. I mean, and you see that in a lot of like depictions of dinosaurs and paleo art and stuff that that people will put like green landscapes in, and it wouldn't have looked that way. At least it wouldn't have looked like grass. It wouldn't have been yeah. so solid. Um, because yeah, grass. I guess and grass first, and grass did appear in the late Cretaceous, although although they weren't abundant. They only right. became very abundant, like the, the open grasslands are very recently, basically. Actually, yeah, but the common the ancestor yeah. between between the yeah. fescue in your backyard and bamboo was sometime in the late Cretaceous. So yeah, right, right, right. Uh, it, that's like the two extremes, I guess. Uh, because uh, bamboo is a grass. Bamboo is the biggest grass or the largest grass. Though mm -hmm. you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned palm trees earlier too, and palm trees are closer related to grass yes. than they are to. Uh, uh, they're, mon uh, they're monocots, yes. Monocots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a interesting kind of uh, uh, convergence there as well. Now, when we talk about the seed dispersal, though, we'll get back to plants or to to grasses because they they are actually more of a uh, that, that that's more of something that they're that they're utilizing uh, animals for when it comes to grasses as opposed to uh, pollination but uh, that's gonna be like the second half of this the the bottom of the bin but nectar is the main selling point of the of the conversation today and nectar uh, is important agriculturally as well because we make uh, what what we don't make it the bees make it honey is made from mm -hmm. nectar the sugar in honey is from from flower nectar so it doesn't do have they also do they also make bee wax from nectar or uh, so for, from something else uh the bee wax is actually uh i, I don't believe it's made from nectar but it, I, I believe it's like uh secretions from the actual bees uh, themselves um all right i could be wrong about that if i'm wrong about that somebody correct mm, me I, I, I'm, I, will, I will look at it i think i may yeah. maybe quickly look it up but yeah yeah, I, I, I could definitely be incorrect about that. Um, uh, now, where was I? Let's see. Go back in here. Okay, so bees, again, have their specialized little, little saddle bags. Now, uh, interesting factor about bees when it comes to pollination in the colors that flowers, uh, that flowers take, many, many uh, species of of flowers are colored specifically to appeal to uh, these insects that cannot see in the spectrum of red, but do see really well in the spectrum of light called ultraviolet. With ultraviolet, it turns uh, your garden basically into a black light poster of, uh, of a buffet for bees to be enticed by. Because bees are uh, the, again, they re the plants are releasing the, 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 the scents and pheromones into the air to entice them, but they're also wanting to visually target them in. So you'll see the patterns on flowers and things appeal mm -hmm. to bees specifically. Uh, actually, this next slide is what we were just talking about, self-pollination uh, versus cross-pollination. I think you covered that pretty well, so I'll just roll right past that. Yeah, uh, I was thinking of bees and, uh, and pollination stuff. Mm -hmm. What made, I don't say, well, I can't say what made it, but they're, they're in the wasp family, right? Yeah, so wasps... To, instead of eating meat and eating meat and stuff they decide to go pollen they decide to eat nectar yeah so it, that's a, it's an interesting point there too wasp are uh are again a term that we use uh polyphyletically uh it could be used monophyletically but we'd have to change some things around because mm -hmm. we would that would make uh bees and ants wasps because again like yeah. when we're talking about with the with the the plants uh there are wasps that are closer related to bees than they are to other wasps or closer related to ants than they are to other wasps there. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of variety just within that, within that order there. Uh, Hymenoptera and the wasp, like what we have as a yellow jacket now, um, they still crave sugar and they'll still pollinate many wasps still pollinate uh, much like I was talking about flies. A lot of people don't think about wasps as pollinators, but they really are. 
yeah. there aren't too many clades of insects that, that, that don't have pollinators in them. Uh, you have pollinators among the, uh, among the beetles, of course. You have pollinators among uh, the ants. You have pollinators among the cockroaches. You have pollinators just in just about every clade yeah. that you can think of. Uh, mainly, mainly, the bi- mainly the big four uh, uh, insects clades like the, the diptera, the diptera, flies and mosquitoes, flies. Mm-hmm. and the hymenoptera, the, uh, the uh, ants, bees, mm-hmm. and wasps. And also the Lepidoptera, the Mars butterflies, and also the uh, Celioptera, the, the beetles. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the big four. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and beetles, uh, the beetles that pollinate, maybe you don't see them too much around here, too, but in the in the rainforest, the, be- the pollinating, pollinating beetles get huge and they're really good at hovering and really loud. So like little helicopters look like drones <laughs> hovering in front of the flowers. Uh, and, th- and then we move outside of insects, of course, because... We're talking about uh, about bats and birds, and uh, we're going to see some maybe unexpected pollinators up here. So uh, I was talking earlier about how the uh, pollen grains look and how they are structured. Also, also a quick thing. You, you were right about beeswax. Like uh, bees have a uh, glands on the abdomen that they will make beeswax. So yeah. you, were, you were right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I thought maybe that was the case. I, I thought I'd seen a video of like them building it with their abdomens. Um, but yeah, the, uh, so the, uh, the shape and form of pollen is related to the method of pollination. Insects, uh, insect pollinated species have sticky or barbed pollen grains. Now that can be correlated, not just to insects and, and, uh, and, and, I guess arachnids too, because there are arachnid pollinators as well. Spiders do pollinate. Uh, crab spiders uh, are one group that definitely uh, pollinates. And there are spiders that do uh, dispersal too and uh, eat nectar, but we will get into that in a minute. Uh, so yeah, wind pollinated species are have lightweight pollen and small grains like corn pollen. But uh, some species of plants, of flowering plants, have actually evolved to... Uh, have their flowers around the <laughs> around the fruit of other other plants, so that when a uh, an frugivore organism comes up to eat the plants or to eat the fruit, it gets some of their pollen on them. But oh, is it, is it, uh, the, the different species, like uh, the, the fruit, is different species than the flower. Yeah, yeah, like uh, oh. the, the so kind of like kind of like a cuckoo bird lives. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, so there's a there's whole clades of plants of angiosperm plants that grow on other angiosperms that are uh, what we call trees. Tree isn't really an, uh, a clade or a, a, a grouping. It's a uh, it's a description. It's a it's a ecological role. It's not uh, yeah, it's like a, like the a description of flying or arboreal right. or uh, terrestrial. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it's how it's a, it's a, a, basically a niche in a in a in a, in a biome that, that needs to be filled by something and there's going to be a vacuum for some clade to fill it but there are uh, uh, I think, I think the technical term terrifying. is epi- the epiphyte is I think the technical term for a plant that, that grows on another plant I think right epiphyte there we go yeah that uh, that are parasitic to them um <laughs> speaking of uh of that that type of uh, organism uh, I'd almost forgotten when I was talking about nectar earlier that uh, there are also plants, flowers that do, that do produce nectar that smells like rotting corpses. Carnivorous mm-hmm. plants will do that uh, to attract, uh, you know, animals that want to eat a rotting corpse into their into their petals and uh, where they fall into a, a sticky digestive fluid that, uh, yeah. that decomposes them. But uh, nectar, 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 it's the... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a very fu- it's a very funny story. Like uh, first flowers you've nectar to uh, to uh, mutually be- attract uh, insects as a mutable, mutual uh, beneficial interaction, but then some flowers like mm, I have a better idea. <laughs> I will attract. I will eat them. Uh, the biggest the biggest animal betrayal of all time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Here's a. Uh, uh, pollinator that uh that feeds on nectar that you might not expect it's a this is a rodent um and you'll notice that as when we get through this list uh that the organisms that are especially uh 
adapted to feeding on nectar often have this like long narrow snout that uh, allows them to stick their snout down deep into the flowers because the flowers want to get as much pollen on the organism that's feeding off of them as possible. The more pollen, the better chances of a successful reproduction. So, so they uh, deep down in there. Yeah. They're like, you got to stick it deep down mm. in there in order to get that. So that's not just a human thing. Um, <laughs> so we see uh, some variety. How well is this showing up? And those are kind of small. Uh, I, I can see it good, so I, at least for my screen. But the, yeah, let me try yes. to zoom in just a little bit. That's kind of big, but all right. So, uh, flower structure is one thing that we do like to look at when we're talking about evolution. And Ness already mentioned uh, Darwin's, uh, what is that, the star uh, lily, the Malay, Malaysia? Or like one or like one, I, I forgot the name of the species, but one orchid in Madagascar that was specifically pollinated by a by a moth, and he, yeah. he predicted that a moth existed that a a foot long tongue, or proboscis, yes. Yeah, I think I have a picture of it down here below. So we will we will tackle that. But these uh, looking at the way that these flowers are structured, see this this is specific to bats versus hummingbirds and how the flowers are structured. Uh, there is some definitely some crossover, but you see more of a splayed wow. open flower for the, the bat. Now, the bat does not uh, have a these long... These are all orchids, right? These are, I think so. Uh, yes, I think these are all orchids. Uh, right. They all look like orchids. Yeah. Uh, this is not an orchid. Uh, they, they, you, like a, if, if many, many times I uh, switch from, uh, like, uh, uh, from hummingbird to... Uh, to bat pollination, like, so like many, many, yeah. many different times, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what. That's what. So the, the, like, the, the, so the certain animals co-evolve with certain flowers. Yeah. And uh, they're not the only, you know, for via or for pollination purposes, aren't the only way, way that plants react that way too. Plants know what animals are around them. Their plants are more aware than we think they are. They actually have alarm signals they send down through the mycorrhizal mm -hmm. network. They have. Uh, communications about nutrients and they share nutrients and they're, they're they live in mutualistic communities like, and like via their their fungus internet mm -hmm. yeah they have uh and that's one of the another way that uh invasive plants will uh will attack uh native plants is by uh cutting off their uh their connection to the mycelium and uh destroying their their the ecology that way uh or taking over the ecology that way um it's uh, it's kind of uh, kind of wild that they can do that. But uh, yeah, so we see uh, mutualism in the development. And I was, what was I saying? Oh yeah. About uh, not other than pollinator uh, holly trees is what I think of mainly when I, when that comes up and that's that. Uh, so like of a holly tree uh, starts to uh, get fed on by a folivore, like a deer, it, it will produce spiky leaves that look kind of like what you think of when you think of a holly leaf. That's why they're so spiky like that because the previous leaf that grew there was eaten by a deer or, or some, or cow or some other animal. And it grew that spiky leaf there in defense. So you'll see holly trees actually with spiky leaves down at the bottom and uh, right, just regular round the leaves at the top because they respond to their environment. And that's what we're seeing here in this topic about the difference with the bats and the hummingbirds. Uh, this is just, a, I thought this was a nice schematic to show the differences between the way the plants respond to the organisms um, when they're, when they're being fed on by them. So you see the differences in the way that the, the flowers develop. You got a shorter, uh, uh, shorter flowering body. I'm not sure what the proper term for that would be. I, I'm sure it was in your slides back there. I just didn't pay attention, but uh, I'm more interested in the, in the organisms and their interesting proboscises and, uh, and, uh, Proposci and and they're interesting tongues because they uh, pollinators have one or the other usually really a really uh, long tongue or a really long proboscis to help them uh, suck the nectar out. All right, so uh, unexpected uh, day geckos are actually pollinators and they're not just this isn't just a one time thing. They are pollinators. That's uh, they're one of their main food sources is nectar. Mm. They're they're very fond of it. That. Yeah, you can uh, you can actually feed them. I we had a day gecko some years ago, and we fed we would feed it agave um, nectar, and it just loved it. Uh, an agave nectar. And a, a question: Do 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 uh, flowers that attract geckos are all are they also uh, often red colored? 
Are they red colored? Uh, uh, yes, I, I've I've uh, heard that the the color red is especially uh, uh, noticeable for uh, like for the uh, reptiles and birds, yeah. and that's why that's why many flowers uh, that attract uh, also hummingbirds are also red as well. Yeah, I didn't know that about uh, about red for reptiles. Uh, I know that for birds, red is is very vibrant. Um, birds have an amazing spectrum of of visual acuity uh, for colors. I would love to be able to see as many colors as a bird can see, but uh, insects do too, but they're shifted off towards the, uh, towards yeah. the violet into the spectrum more so than, uh, than, than birds are. Birds seem to just have the whole spectrum. It's crazy, but uh, I'm not sure if geckos uh, are responding visually or, uh, or if they're, there's a chemo receptor uh, response, uh, maybe mm. uh, scent. Mm. I think it could be that they, that they are attracted to the coloration. I'm not sure about that. I'll have to look. Well, what that. colors are uh, flowers that attract bats? Often, like, are they often white or uh, colors? Yeah, white, uh, light yellow, like uh, what they call moon flowers, uh, coloration mm. flowers that bloom at night. Oh, uh, also yellow? Also yellow? Yeah. It's, it's, yellow. It's, 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 it's interesting because the color yellow is often the most noticeable color for mammals in the dark. And that is why... Taxis are often call, uh, called yellow because they are. Right. That's, that's why we picked yellow for those colors. Yeah, and that's how we evolved. He'll evolve with the taxis. Now, <laughs> pollination. Just this is just one a one-off little topic here. I just wanted to hit up real quick. That's a little blurry. Um, is that uh, hunger is not the only way that <laughs> the only way that flowers trick uh, insects into pollinating them? Mm -hmm. Because if you are if you are a horny wasp, if you are a horny bee, and you see this big round abdomens, look at those big round abdom abdomens, so enticing. Yeah, I, I heard a lot of orchids trick. trick. Mm -hmm. These are orchids, and, and they uh, they smell just like a uh, uh, female bee, and the male just comes right up on there and wants to do their business. Sometimes males will dogpile these flowers because they smell so good. And collect all the pollen off of them while they're doing their their bee mm -hmm. thing. Now bees actually have a very large penis too, so uh, they uh, are also uh, copulating with this flower, or think they are copulating with this flower while they're collecting the pollen. So, it, uh, so it's there's a, that. I just thought I couldn't not bring that no. up. <laughs> or, or, or just to just take one step further in the attacking insects. Yeah. By making by making basically nature's blow up dolls. <laughs> yes, nature's blow up dolls for bees. <laughs> this is the uh, the the what we were talking about the one that Darwin predicted. So they didn't know about this moth's existence at all. It was unknown to science, but they knew this flower existed. Charles Darwin examined the flower and said there has to be a pollinator, a moth specifically. I think he said that what. I, I, uh, Ness, correct me if I'm wrong, was specifically he predicted that it would be a moth that pollinates this flower based on the structure. Oh, I, I, th I think maybe, perhaps not specifically a moth, but he, he did predict, predict an, an, a pollinator with a uh, uh, a specific length of uh, tongue or proboscis or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure uh, yeah. if it was he knew it was going to be a lepidopteran or not. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, and then also just to. Uh, <laughs> reiterate what figs. we talked about with the wasp and the in the figs in the reproduction i did pull this image back up specifically uh because nestle brought it up and i thought it would be a fun little thing to talk on so yes they they get basically mummified inside this there's and this isn't all figs so if you've eaten figs before you've probably eaten plenty of uh fig wasps uh there's nothing wrong with eating them they're they're, they're, they're gonna be just also I, I, I think the, i think the, the the like the like when when figs are pollinated by wasps then the, the wasp will often die inside them but mm -hmm. however i think uh by the time you eat them the the wasp are basically digested they are gone yeah like, absorbed you, you by, eat, yeah, by yeah, yeah, absorbed, figs. yeah i've only so, ever I, i've never eaten fresh figs i've only ever eaten them in the newton form yeah, they're best in the Newton form. I do like fig Newtons. Um, and maybe that's an American thing. Do you like? Do you all have fig Newtons over there, Ness? Uh, I, I I don't often eat figs, but I I think I, I it's, it's more of a luxury here. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, gotta... I think I think I'm I've oh, I've only eaten figs during a buffet where you have these like big salad uh, mm -hmm. uh, plates with figs on on them are, and such. Yeah. Are they dried or are they fresh? Uh, fr fresh, yes. 
Yeah, we don't get too many fresh figs over here at all. We if, if I get figs, they're usually like dried, like in a trail mix style. Mm. Um, anyhow, uh, and then the lastly, I'm not going to go over this too much because we're mostly talking about the flowers and the flowering of these organisms, but because seed dispersal could be uh, applied to more than just angiosperms, mm -hmm. but it is important, uh, an important part of the way that uh, that angiosperms uh, disperse and spread over a uh, geographic area. And, uh, as Ness was saying, uh, earlier in the stream, uh, fruit is a, uh, is a the, dispersal the, method. Yeah. yeah the, the primary dispersal method of a great many, uh, angiosperm groups. Uh, you know, there are other methods as well, but, uh, cause like it, but like things like coconuts, for instance, I know that we'd said mm -hmm. we we're going to come back to grasses when we talked about, uh, seed dispersal coconuts uh disperse through the uh via the ocean they generally yes. are, are, are spreading through drifting over currents and not being necessarily carried by an organism so uh but there are definitely grasses that uh that do disperse through these through, through a method of of organisms and not just grasses but uh uh the uh, rosids uh are a group that uh that are well evolved to uh, uh, have a mutualistic relationship with uh, songbirds. With uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not going to come to me now. With uh, with songbirds, uh, essentially. Yeah. So because they all they disperse their seeds, they nest in their branches. There's a, a whole ecological relationship there between between the two. Anyhow. Um, you can see this across the animal kingdom. Uh, we are. And, and I think uh, like, a fruit, like a tiny fruit or uh, berries that, that are attracting to birds are also often called red, I think, right? They are also uh, uh, red what? colored. Like, like, like uh, the, the fruit that uh, are meant to be for birds are also often colored red, I think. Yes, they're color. Yeah, the red coloration. Uh, yeah. Reds and, and oranges, uh, I think, are. The, the prominent color and when they're then when they're not ripe yet they're green so that the birds can't see them basically mm -hmm. um so that's their uh that's their dispersal <clears throat> excuse me that's their dispersal mechanism and the most prominent uh dis seed dispersing organism that i can think of that's on my head is probably us um mm -hmm. we have spread a multitude of plants uh both agricultural and invasive around the yeah. world via our mechanations. Uh, I mean, some of them were early on uh, things like. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I spread I mean, some stuff like, like briars and uh, that's the tech on my, my pant legs. And I spread them that we, are, way. I, we, all, we also have a broad the uh, honeybee uh, with them because yes. so, some, some crops still need to be pollinated and then, in areas where uh, the pollen is not native, we bring just honeybees with us to pollen. Right. Uh, but there are uh, crops that the honeybees, that the European honeybees cannot uh, fertilize. Yes. Uh, squashes and gourds. Um, tomatoes are one uh, that can't be pollinated by non-native species. Or so. so all right. Oh, actually, I, I, I've, I've worked in the. Uh, Companies where they uh, uh, worked on uh, tomatoes and they used like uh, bumblebees to uh, bumblebees. Them. Yeah, bumblebees yeah. are native. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. are there any uh, human pollinated plants? Yeah, we we pollinate uh, a lot of plants. Like we were talking about earlier about the uh, uh, anachronistic evolution, or where uh, plant species survive as long after its pollinators or uh, seed dispersers are are extinct. Um, and we actually supplement that by artificial pollination. That's why a lot of uh, crops, what is that, papayas, I think, that, uh, that, that their price went up like 750% because the they're now pollinated solely by humans. I can't remember if it was papayas. I want to say it was papayas. But their crops are, are pollinated strictly by... Like mango, maybe? It might have been a mango. Yeah, it was some, one of, the, one of the, the staple tropical fruits. Mm. Um. But uh, yeah, mango sounds like it'd be probably even more correct. Anyway, um, yeah. Other than that, I don't really have too much to uh, too much to, to cover here. Yeah. So, Although uh, one, one, one thing to, uh, funny to note is like the uh, the dandelion. 
we, or that you saw, or like uh, you can also see in the picture previously, uh, where you see the see the seeds being dispersed by parachutes. Mm-hmm. Technically, those are also fruit. So basically, you have flo- floating fruit in the air when you see flying the, the fruit. Design. Yeah, <laughs> flying fruit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> over some stuff I found. Okay, I, yeah, I, look at it. But yeah, there's the body shape. I can talk about the body shape and the mouth shape for, for different flowers. And the nectar and mouth too. Yeah. Is, uh, is, is, there, is there one is there one specific group of bats that are pollinators or did, did pollinating bats evolve uh, many times? Or, there uh, are multiple groups of pollinating bats uh, in, in bats that uh, are seasonal. Um, I mean, essentially anytime they're in a temperate zone, they're seasonal pollinators. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, uh, a, a different ecologies. Uh, mega bats and micro bats will, uh, will tend towards uh, uh, nectar feeding when the opportunity arises. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think uh, I've also one uh, fun fact to note, like you mentioned that uh, some, some fruits are specifically meant for birds. It's actually, uh, one interesting to note is like uh, you know like uh, peppers or maybe like the, the hot bell pepper and such. Mm-hmm. They have a substance called capsaicium, which makes their uh, uh, which causes the hot sensation when you eat them. Yeah, and makes your to note, yeah makes your mouth you, you you on yeah. fire. It's crazy. Yes. Yeah. And 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 the, the interesting to note is that that, that that already happens in mammals. It doesn't happen in bird, like when birds eat peppers, they don't uh, taste the uh, capsaicium. So the, so the thinking goes is that that is a deterrent specifically for mammals because mammals have molars and when they eat the fruit, they also tend to chew up the seeds. But when birds eat eat these fruit, it just they, they just swallow them whole and uh, poop out the seeds. So it's basically. Uh, determined specifically for mammals and uh, not for birds. Yes. You know, I wonder that's if galliforms, <laughs> if I wonder if galliforms are, would respond to it. If, I mean, uh, birds, because mm. they're birds, but they have, they, they, you know, they eat the, uh, the stones and uh, grind it up. Cause you remember that, uh, that thing about uh, the dodo or whatever, that there was a, uh, right. a plant there, a uh, uh, on uh, Marat, Mar- how do you say, Maritimus or Meridius Island, uh, that uh, only the that would only prosper and thrive with the dodo there to eat its seeds and process it through its digestive mm. system. I think that turned out to be like bunk, but it was still an interesting uh, thought experiment. Mm. Yeah. I, I've, I've also heard like in, in Hawaii or on one of the Hawaiian islands, mm-hmm. there are these. Uh, and like these, these, these plants that, that have an overkill of prickly uh, leaves and prickly thorns, and uh, and uh, the the hypothesis is that uh, like the there used to be a type of duck, uh, the, mm-hmm. the the I think mola mola or something like mola, that. Mola mola, yeah, mola, the mola, mola, mola duck, and and they and they uh, they had like uh, turtle like beaks that are uh, adept at eating tough uh, vegetation like that. And they they are all extinct. It's a pretty also pretty weird. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. I can't, I can't turn this in any closer, but the, 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 top, the top part, it says floral single convergence pollination syndromes, like the hummingbird, the, the like the insects and oh, the yeah. moths, different things. And down yeah, here, a flower, I, I, yeah. See yeah. how the, the flowers that are attracting the bees are purple and the flowers mm-hmm. that are attracting the hummingbird are red? Yes. There is crossover there, um, but, and then the trees that are attracting the moths are white and uh and they would be, I, mean, I think yellow would be all right to put on there as well. But uh, uh, that'd be more if they're wanting to attract bats, would be put yellow on there. That's mm-hmm. uh, kind of what me and Ness were talking about just a few minutes ago. So, yeah, this is how the colors attract different uh, different groupings. And down there is what we were talking about, the flora mim- mimicry. Food plant mimicry, sexual mimicry with the orchid, and I guess death is memory. Yeah, the the, the, cor- the corpse flower they will they will mm-hmm. stink like uh, flesh, yes, rotten flesh. Like like when like when some flies lay their egg, eggs and dead things, and they, like I said, they lay their eggs right. and pollinate the dead flowers. And it's the same kind of specialized glands that produce nectar. So that stink is actually a, a stinky nectar. <laughs> yeah, and it's also like it's also a very uh, also a notable thing like flowering plant because flowering plants. Uh, they tend to uh, come up with very specialized pheromones to attract insects. Like they, they are basically a, a chemical factory with very, m- many different types of chemicals. Like uh, they, they, have, they, have, they have a whole, a whole new section of metabolism called 
uh, secondary metabolism, or also called specialized metabolism. And animals like us simply do, do have that. So they have like a, a, a very distinct chemistry with them. Yeah. yeah. And that is also one of the reasons why plants are very important with uh, discovering new uh, medicines. Like they, they, like we have on, like many different compounds that are, remain undiscovered are just waiting in some remote plant species. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that is why bio, and that is why biodiversity, protecting biodiversity is important. And that's my last oh, yeah. uh, note on that. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> and Bree talked about this the fig wasps things. And also the difference between honeybees and native bees. Because native bees can prob probably, we, we bring a lot of honeybees in, but they all, sometimes they, they outcompete the native bees that can only. Yeah. Pet. Only flowers can do them, not the honeybees. Uh, it's it's a it's one thing that uh, it's it's one of my uh, my uh, one of my problems with some mainstream environmentalists is that they will like uh, of course protect. I, I think protecting bees is good, but they often overlook the fact that in most areas of the world, honeybees are not native, and they are actually uh, endangering the native honeybees. Yeah, that's so often that. that's often overlooked. That's a drum I beat so much. So thank you, Ness, for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, Save the Bees is not about European honeybees. European honeybees, uh, apis, are a, yeah. uh, a de invasive domestic agricultural population. They're they're livestock. Wow. They're not they're not they're not wild animals. They're livestock. So we need to yeah. not protect the invasive bees, and we need to protect the native bees. Wow. Also, also stingless bees. Yeah, most native bees are stingless too, so there's that. Uh, bumblebees being the exception, but even bumblebees are not as uh, prone to stinging as, as what you see in, in domestic honeybees. So, domestic honeybees aren't prone to stinging either by any means, but uh, bumblebees are even more gentle. But they'll they'll sting you if you if you press them. Yeah, yeah. and so and so and some honeybees are also like uh, very aggressive, uh, Africanized bees. Like what the hell? What the hell did we do? What the hell did we think with them? The, like that, yeah, yeah, created a monster, right? Yeah. yeah. And here are some stamps honoring our pollinators. I guess this is one. It's also one of my uh, 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 points that I have pollinated. Like also many environment. Like as 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 I mentioned briefly, environmentalists often overlook certain things. Like that's also a thing. Like oh, they will complain about GMOs, like the dangerous genetically modified crops. But then they will overlook things like Africanized bees that are. Technically not GMOs, but still not well, I mean, good for not good for the environment. By, yeah. It depends on what you mean by GMO though, because yeah. if you mean an animal that's that's been it's had its genes modified artificially by human intervention, we've been doing that for mm -hmm. about uh twenty thousand years. But uh you know, on some scale. But we wouldn't we we wouldn't have corn or we eat wheat without GMOs. Right. Mm -hmm. So but and people, do, people kind of get like, oh, where do you, you, where do you draw the line? I guess they think a, a gene manipulation is is the issue. But again, we've been doing that since what the fifties. I, I think, I think, it's too, I think uh, it's not the modifying part. It's just, just what, what is the outcome of the modifying? That, that, that's, that's it. Like if, if, if the outcome is something like an Africanized bee, then that's bad. Right. That, 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 yeah. <laughs> but if it's a crop that do. can produce more food for. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Hungry population, then that's good. Yeah. yeah. I'm just glad the Africanized bees can't get up far north of where I live yet. There was a, in the 90s, there was a big scare about them coming up into Texas and stuff. It was. Yeah. Did they ever? I don't think they ever made it up here to Texas. I think they didn't think they made it. Uh, past the... like I, I have seen that they are less aggressive uh, or becoming less aggressive when they are like uh, on their own. But uh, yeah, they. But still, I I don't know why they don't have a ch a chill button on them. Like when you provoke them, they will chase you down for miles. For miles. It's really scary. Yeah. yeah. Now, cross pollination. Can you can a flower pollinate in a different species of flower, or are they not compatible? Like like. Well, that... you can make you can make hybrids between closely related species. Okay, I I just wonder I I didn't know if it was, if it was like a dot like a 
like a mule that a horse or donkey can can have a kid that that kid's usually infertile and not the same. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and plants are very different. Like you, you can often have a situation where uh, hybridization causes the descendant to inherit the full, not not, not just half the genome, but the full genome of both species. It's called the allo polyploidy. And, as a, and a good example is like uh, many many types of wheat actually has three full genomes of three an ancestral species. It's really weird. Like, a, like ima imagine uh, an animal that, that, that has the full genome of a, uh, a horse, a full genome of a zebra, and a full genome of a donkey. <laughs> That's basically some, yeah. It's a, uh, and that's that's basically that's basically some the mo of many varieties of wheat. All right, all right. So, so Bree, let's come up. Any kind of on your channel you want to advertise? Interesting. Um, yeah, like uh, I am still doing live from the hive every Saturday at nine thirty a.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Over here in the U.S., um, we cover uh, cryptids. Uh, we uh, we cover uh, creationism. We cover uh, science. So we just do a kind of a, a skeptic breakdown of, of different claims every week. Uh, I put a lot of uh, oh, energy into the research. Uh, it's my channel, Brain Bug. Huh. Yeah, uh, and, and then you also. So, and for those who can't make it live, you also break it, break it sections down throughout the week too. Yeah. So uh, the segments, uh, each segment is uh, generally about a half an hour, and uh, I break them down into shorter half an hour or so videos. Uh, some of them are shorter, some of them are longer. If I, I can take from one to add to the other, <laughs> but they break them down into shorter videos that release throughout the week, so you don't have to sit there and watch a uh, two-hour video if you're only interested in my cryptic corner. You can go watch that and watch Bigfoot and ghosts and stuff like that. If you're interested in creation busting stuff, you can go watch uh, Creation Watch and see Matt Powell and Kent Hovind uh, standing for truth. We responded to people <laughs> like that. Uh, or you can, uh, if you just like science and just want to learn science stuff, I got the Hive Science where we just talk about, we'll talk about new scientific discoveries, just some science piece that tickled my fancy and I wanted to talk about. Uh, recently, we talked about, on Hive Science, we talked about this notion, uh, this, uh, this kind of pop science, this notion that uh, feathered dinosaurs are part of the gay agenda. So that was, <laughs> that was pretty funny. What? Yeah, it was, uh, there, there were so many, I, I had to go deep dive and go all over social media, typing in gay dinosaurs gay agenda dinosaurs and found all these posts of these uh uh mouth breathers claiming that uh that making dinosaurs have feathers is gay it's part of a gay agenda uh because well, we want to what about feathers that. is what about feathers is gay like how how what, what is are they funny thinking? Is, the, is the overlap of this <laughs> demographic with people who have a bald eagle as their uh as their avatar <laughs> They're sitting there saying how you, feathers are, are gay and, and, and feminine and whatnot. And then they have this uh, bird that I'm assuming they, I think, is very like masculine. Go, uh, go, go, go hang out with the, the cassowary and uh, yeah. talk to me later. Would they be offended by a flamingo? If they see a flamingo, they think like, oh. All feathers are, <laughs> are gay unless they're bald eagle and patriotic. Well, I am... Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's funny that the people get so that people would get triggered by that. I don't mind having feathered dinosaurs as a uh, as a symbol or a uh, uh, mascot for for the LGBTQ. It doesn't that does that sounds yeah. Let's do it. Make that a thing. So uh, whatever. Uh, but uh, it's actually badass. <laughs> but it's not. Yeah, they, it doesn't work just... the other way around. It doesn't yeah. like oh we mm -hmm. need to change the dinosaurs to make them more LGBTQ. <laughs> no, yeah. it's how they. It's how they. It's how they came about. So, right. so Ness, anything? You, are you making anything on your channel in the future? Or uh, you... oh, no, 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 I, uh, my my channel is not uh, active. Uh, I do mostly stuff for Jackson Reed. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, we, we recently we, we recently published a video on the gorilla tail. Yeah, oh, yeah I, I, I saw that. If but, you want to know whether or not you can out drink a gorilla, go watch <clears> Jackson's <throat> video because they do get to that at the end of the video about. Yeah. yeah. 
It but was you do want to see go to this channel then he Ness made a a re a remix of a of a of a thing about uh nuclear power for my channel and he mm -hmm. made it much more manageable and bite size we we'll go check that out if you haven't yet yes. yeah nuclear uh, all, all, all my few videos, all my few videos i made the uh, yeah, yeah re remixed version you know, of that yes yeah as for me, next week I will have uh, Eric V. Howard, Tony Reed, and David Neff, and we'll be talking about prejudices and dis discrimination in, here in America and the world and how mm -hmm. it's still a thing. And then two weeks from now, I'll have my friend Hauser and Amner on. The, yeah, see, my friend Hauser. And Amnon will be on to talk about their Twitch uh, streaming platform called HAP, Help All People. They're trying to make, they're trying to get everyone to uh, help each other on on Twitch to hmm. get a big community going on there. That'll be in two cool. weeks. Right. Cool. So, yes. I we saw we saw what uh, Ness go to sleep very soon and. All right, brain bug. You want to say your catchphrase? Yes, please. Be kind and take care. All right. As I always say, never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. I'll see you next time. <laughs>